Hi everyone, welcome to another episode at the CEO Club. Today I have a very special guest with me, Mr. Sanjay. Sanjay, how are you doing? How are you doing, Asif? How are you doing? I'm good, thank you very much. Do you want to introduce yourself? So, uh, uh, my name is Sanjay. Um, we've known each other for many years. Um, you know, I've, I run my own recruitment business, my recruitment pal. Um, you know, I started off in the legal industry and moved on into recruitment. Nice. So, where I like to start off with all my guests is taking it right back to the beginning. So let's start off from where we grew up. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we grew up in Bradford in uh, the BD3 area in Thornbury. Um, as you know, we were living in the same street. Uh, we grew up in uh, the Thornbury, uh, you know, street there. Um, and as you know, it was um, rough and ready, basically. <laughs> rough and ready, that's one way to describe BD3. So, you know, uh, full of culture. I mean, everyone knew everyone. Yeah. You know, the families knew each other, you know, whether they were white, whether they were Asian, whether they were Indian, you know, it didn't matter <coughs> what race or background you were from. Everyone knew each other. They respected each other, you know. And I think um, all the kids, um, they were just kids. We were all just kids. So we played with everyone, you know, um, you know, you, you, you were friends with everyone, you know, and we'd have different seasons, you know, marble season, pogs, you know, yeah. football season, you know, cricket rounders, etc. It was funny just how the seasons just came up. You know, yeah. I remember the six weeks summer holidays. Yeah. They felt like forever, didn't they? They felt like forever. Six I weeks. mean, now six weeks go like that. And you oh. literally, uh, I mean, now we go with the six weeks holidays just before they start in the selling the school uniforms in the in the supermarket, you know, and that just makes you think, wow, you know, there's no nothing like six weeks holidays anymore. Times have changed. Times have changed. So, yeah, growing up in B3 was interesting. So we, uh, like Sanjay said, we knew each other from growing up in the same street. Um, so talk to me about your teenage years then. Yeah, I mean, uh, teenage years, um, they were good. Um, you know, we used to go, I, I went to school in Leicesterdyke, you know, um, and, um, you know, I had different friends there, you know, um, Asian friends. English friends, you know, black friends, you know, they're, they're a mix of people, you know, um, as an Indian, I was a minority. Um, but that, that, that wasn't an issue for me as such, um, you know, and I got along with everyone, you know, and um, like I said, in the street, we, uh, I learned a lot, you know, different languages, speaking to, you know, uh, all the different aunties, trying to figure out what they're saying, and then you pick it up over the years. Also, you know, um, your Asian friends, they speak to you in their language sometimes as well. So, so you learn a lot, you know, makes you streetwise. Yeah. And just whilst we're on that topic, uh, touching upon growing up as the minority Indian in a majority, would you say Pakistani area? Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, Bradford 3, uh, you know, and Thornbury especially uh, was a Pakistani area. Uh, you know, I think there was um, uh, two Indian families, including myself. There's a couple of <coughs> white families in there as well. Um, and yet we had no issues. Yet we had no issues in the street whatsoever. Everyone lived, um, you know, and respected one another, you know. And uh, the aunties, uncles would look out for each other's children. It didn't matter, you know, what 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 color or background they were from. So that was a really nice thing about our street. Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the things we wanted to touch upon in this podcast mm -hmm. is you're Indian and Pakistani. Uh, there's always conflicts going on. There's always a division that's created. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's about pushing the right message, mm -hmm. unity. You're Indian and Pakistani. We have a lot of similarities and when you instead of looking at the differences when you look at the similarities within our our culture and our the way of living is uh, is very similar there's more similarities than there are differences <coughs> excuse me um you know i mean um all religions you know um uh, um you know teach peace you know to live with one another you know to love your neighbors you know, uh, to be treated, to treat people like you would uh, like to be treated. And I think, you know, um, I mean, um, you know, we've been friends for years now, you know, since we were kids. And that just shows that, 
you know um the cultures are very much similar you know we're all family orientated looking after your parents looking after your family you know treating people with respect uh, all that's there you know um but you know um you, you know religion is where there are differences but you know i mean all are kind of you know uh, all leads to the same message every religion leads to the same message of peace and treating people with humanity yeah that's very very true so what message would you put out there for people that have a uh, bias maybe pakistanis against indians or indians versus pakistanis well, what kind of message would you put out there <laughs> i mean you know i mean we all come from the same land you know india and pakistan were one country yeah um and for hundreds of years they lived side by side you know eat together work together pray together you know live together you know they'd go to each other's weddings they'd eat, go to each other's funerals you know they'd be there for each other's celebrations you know um for hundreds of years there was that then obviously uh the british came in and it was kind of you know um divide and rule you know divide put their oar in you know um and you know that was done everywhere it wasn't just done in you know um india it wasn't just done uh you know it was also done in africa it was it's it's done all over the world and that's why they had such a big empire they've obviously then come out of the country not by choice but you know uh because obviously the independence happened but that's where um indian pakistan were formed and that's where a lot of division happened yeah now it's been so many years i don't know 75 80 years i don't know uh, how long the independence has now been but we still to this day have that same issue yeah and the british have gone they're not interested they've left both countries but now the countries cannot uh they're finding it very difficult should i say to live in peace and i don't know why because they've done it for th- hundreds of years before and if we can do it in bd3 <laughs> yeah, of course you know then why can't they yeah no, i think just... it's more to do with power than it is um you know the actual uh you know uh, religious side of it or culture side of it because those are similar yeah i have those beliefs i think it's a divide and conquer type mentality yeah. whilst we're fighting with each other and you're indian and i hate you because you're indian and so on and so forth and you hate me because i'm pakistani whilst we're fighting over these these uh minor issues we are avoiding the bigger issues on mm. on sort of the economic issues and yeah. so on and so forth and we're distracted i mean uh, if uh, you know uh, india and pakistan work together they could be a superpower yeah you know they could be a superpower and i think uh, that's why a lot of the countries are afraid of you know and the thing is it it takes more effort to be nasty to someone than it does to be kind and hum- uh, being humble to someone you know talking nicely to someone takes less effort than saying something bad to someone you know so i i believe that peace is the way forward peace is the way for success brilliant that's a really good message and i think uh, that's the kind of message you want to put out there um i like the way that you integrate and vice versa you know like you said i think we said previously where if uh, an uncle's walking past you'll say yeah i'll say to him you know assalamu alaikum uncle you know and you know he'll he'll reply back saying walaikum assalam you know and and those kind of things do matter you know it's 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 about respect you know i've been to the mosque i've been to the gurdwara i've been to the church i've been to the uh, you know obviously i go to the hindu temple you know so i've been to so many places of worship and uh, each place i go to i will follow or try and follow to the best of my ability uh of what they're doing and that's a sign of respect yeah that's very very powerful so moving on from growing up in thornbury um we'll go on to how did you get into the recruitment industry so recruitment industry i got into 
it was a little bit of luck, I'll be honest. So I uh, had no intention or no idea about going into recruitment at all. Um, I was in the legal industry working for a law firm in Wakefield and then I shifted to York uh, for a promotion over there. And I was there for five, six years. <clears throat> and then uh, the York office was closing down and they were merging everything back to Wakefield. And I got to a point, uh, you know, a stage in my life where I felt that I didn't want to carry on in the legal industry anymore. I wanted to do something different. Um, and having worked since I was 16, it was a bit daunting thinking, okay, um, if I take voluntary redundancy, you know, um, and if I don't get a job straight away, what will I do? What shall I do? I didn't know at that point. And uh, basically two weeks before I was due to finish uh, my, um, you know, notice of uh, voluntary redundancy, um, I got a call from a legal recruitment agency from Manchester um, asking me, you know, the see my CV and if I wanted a different legal position. And when I spoke to this lady, she, I said to her, you know, that I don't want to do any kind of legal work anymore. I want to try something different. Therefore, you know, I'm sorry, you know. And she says, oh, have you thought about legal recruitment? I thought, no, that's something. And she explained, you know, what it was about and what they would do and stuff. And I thought, yeah, that sounds right up my street. I'm a people's person. I like to help people. And uh, I have the legal background knowledge, you know, of what you're looking for, what type of industries there are in the legal industry. Um, so I said, yeah, put my CV forward. Um, a couple of weeks later, director rings me, you know, um, saying, we've seen your CV would you like to come in for an interview? We'd like to call you for an interview. So I went for a first interview past that, had a second interview past that, and there I was in legal recruitment. <laughs> oh, okay. So for people that are watching the podcast that maybe don't know what a recruitment agency is or what a recruitment consultant does, how would you explain that? So basically a, a recruitment uh, consultant is someone who will work with companies Okay, I have contracts with companies where they are recruit, re recruiting for them, basically. They'll have vacancies, for example, uh, a lawyer or, uh, or accountant, you know, whatever it might be. And they go and then find those type of candidates, you know, uh, for those jobs, taking their CVs, you know, um, have a chat with the candidates, see what they're wanting, salary, etc. And then if they feel that they're suitable for the position, they will then put their CVs forward to the companies that they're working for, uh, in my case, law firms. And uh, they'll then have a look at the CV. And if they say, OK, yep, we'd like to call them for an interview, they'll let me know. I'll let the um, candidate know. And then they'll go in for an interview, etc. Uh, it could be a couple of interviews. It could be one interview. And once they pass, you know, they'll get, then maybe uh, get an offer of employment so i'm kind of the middleman between, a recruiter is the middleman yeah. between the employer and the employee yes okay so this podcast the ceo club i want i'm probably going to get a lot of people on here that are wanting to join the recruitment industry mm. start up their own recruitment agency so i want this to be the first podcast to watch where they yeah. gain real value and i don't think i've seen a podcast where you've dived into all the different areas uh, concerned so we're going to try and dive into those and give as much value to those people who want to start up mm -hmm. their own agencies or get into the recruitment industry so i'm in the recruitment industry you're in the recruitment industry at times i might just ask you uh, in a way where it sounds like i'm not in it but <laughs> yeah, i'm just sure. doing that for the listeners yeah yeah of course yeah. so one of the questions a lot of people have is why do people use recruitment agencies and pay thousands and thousands of pounds versus just hiring themselves what would your answer be to that so the, so for example uh, let's say uh, you run an accountants firm i run an accountants firm okay i've got staff that you want yeah so um let's say if you recruited directly you're poaching my staff yeah you're basically taking my staff away that is not very good basically it's not very uh, uh, poaching other people's staff is a bit of a no no, you know, contacting them directly, you know. So, for example, if my staff contacted your firm directly, like if you put a vacancy out yeah. and they then applied for it, that would be OK. But if you 
contacted my employee to say come and work for us right that is not a good thing yeah. and therefore um, firms find it very difficult to recruit so they have to have a middle person right who has no ties who has no connections as such with uh, the other law firms or the other accountancy firms etc um, and will then contact you know they can contact people from my firm they can contact people from your firm and say you know vice versa would you like to be employed by these lot and that's how it would be so therefore um you know firms can't just you know recruit themselves they're quite dependent on recruiters yeah so it's not illegal to push people's stuff firstly is it it's not illegal but there's a big taboo about it yeah and it probably damages the company's brand reputation which brand is the reputation most thing. Uh, and that's very important you know i mean firms do do it yeah firms do do it um but when they when they found out it's it causes rifts yeah yeah so that's why the recruitment industry is a huge industry i think there's yeah. uh, from the last research i did there's billions and billions of pounds spent on recruitment agencies every year both in the uk and worldwide yeah. i think it was over 400 billion the last time i checked worldwide and something around the 30 something billion mm. in the uk so all that money is being spent on recruitment agencies and as you know recruitment consultants get a bad reputation <laughs> it's uh it's just how recruitment consultants are seen i think it's the way they approach Okay, so um, when I recruit, I um, my method of recruitment is slightly different to the maybe what you might say average recruiter. Um, the average recruiter will um, treat their candidates like darts, just throwing them and hitting a number and hoping that they succeed. And basically, what I mean by that is that um, a candidate will give uh, the recruiter the CV. Yeah. Okay. And um, that CV will then just be posted out everywhere. Yeah, in the hope that one firm or a couple of the firms will be interested. But that candidate um, doesn't want his or her CV to be posted out at that firm, at that firm, at that firm for many reasons. Either they've approached them themselves before and they've been unsuccessful or they don't like that firm for various reasons or they don't like how that firm's run or you know someone might be working there that they don't want they that they don't get along with there's so many reasons so a lot of consultants kind of piss candidates off by doing that um, they also get on the nerves of um, law firm uh, you know uh, uh, their, their clients yeah because what they do if they haven't got any agreed terms with them what they'll do is they'll just kind of bombard them with CVs now if one's doing that you can handle it but if you get 10 15 20 30 firms doing that on a regular basis it really puts up the clients backs and they don't want to work with recruiters they don't like working with recruiters they also start approaching partners and senior members of staff directly which uh, again HR staff hate because yep. they're the middle people between the the person who finally says yes to us do you see putting them through so they don't like that direct contact either yeah that's some really interesting uh, issues that you've raised there the first thing which is the candidates the way that we go about that is making sure we get a candidate's permission before yeah. we send their CV out to uh, any clients and that gives you that reputation and credibility mm -hmm. with the relationship you build with the candidate as opposed to other agencies that like you said will just uh, send the CVs out to everyone in the hope that they land some interviews and then reverse it go to the candidate and say oh I've got you these interviews yeah. are you interested well I, I give you a typical example uh, you know I had a candidate um, who I put forward to this firm um, the firm comes back to me and says uh, we've had uh, this candidate's CV in the past from another recruiter um, you know um, what's the situation so I spoke to my candidate and he said you know he'd never given any permission or never even heard of this firm before until I kind of told him about it so he goes there's no way that I've given permission to the other recruiter to send my CV there 
So it says, I need that in writing, put that in writing, and I send it to the firm. They said, that's fine. You know, so the other recruiters lost out, wasted their time. You know, had they got the candidate's permission in the first place, it would have been in. They would have got the fee. So it's very important to build that trust, with both your candidates and your clients. Yeah. <coughs> so let's talk about your recruitment experience briefly. We know there's only so much we can cover in an hour, and I want to yeah, cover course, so yeah. many topics. Uh, we'll probably have to do a part two and part three <laughs> at some point. Uh, but for this, I just want to cover a few core topics. So you've now landed a job as a recruitment consultant. Talk to me a little bit about that experience. How is it like going into becoming a recruitment consultant? No previous experience. How was that like for you? It's quite daunting because, I mean, um, you can talk to people. You, you kind of get the gist of, you know, this is the job. This is the job description. But there is a bit of an art to it, you know, and I think training is vital. You know, I think um, if you're trying to set up on your own um you know, completely, you, let's say you've not done recruitment before and you just think, right, today I want to become a, a recruiter and I want to set up my own company. My advice would be, um, if you want to do that, then there is a lot of videos you need to watch maybe online or do some kind of course or something if there is one out there. I think there is a recruitment course uh, out there. Yeah, yeah, uh, plugging it in right now. <laughs> now we, um, we have trained a lot of people that have... Yeah previous recruitment experience and those that haven't and uh, as somebody who has the recruitment rooms academy where we train people up to start their recruitment agencies I would still say on air somebody that has previous recruitment experience with a firm is has always got the advantage well, over somebody that it. hasn't so what was your experience like in your first job as a recruitment consultant then what do you specialize in so uh, i specialize in legal recruitment so um you know uh, like i said i had the legal uh, background you know working with solicitors you know paralegals etc so i kind of knew what, what what type of jobs you know these 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 guys uh have um and therefore i went into the, the legal recruitment uh industry and uh, when i first went in you know it was literally get going uh, <laughs> you know I had a very cold desk um, which means that that area uh, of the UK had not been worked in they'd not really had got uh, any kind of clients there um, so it was building that up so my first job was to build up relationships with law firms in that area I was working the Bristol Cardiff area um you know for law firms um and kind of trying to build the relationship so i'd contact them contact the hr people see if i can um, visit them so i'd go to cardiff and bristol quite often to visit them you know speak to them see what vacancies they have tell them about our firm you know and see if they can give us a few roles you know once you secure that um you know you've got something to work with then your other challenge is looking for candidates in that area so you know there's a lot of people out there will kind of brush you off not reply to your messages you know and then there's some people will reply to your message but say no not interested but at that time this was pre-covid um you know I'd go there and I'd do a, a whole day of just meeting different candidates speaking to them you know, if they bring their CVs, taking their CVs, you know, getting them to email me their CV uh, and speaking to them about, you know, what job they're looking for, you know, why they're not happy in their job, if that is the case or, you know, why they want to move. Um, so various different questions. And then you would give them the options to say, OK, I've got, a, you know, I've got a vacancy here with this firm. What do you think about that? you know speak to them about it if they've got any questions and then send the cv off okay so a day in the life of a recruiter for you was it business development first and then candidate rapport with the other way so, around or does it not I mean, um it just depends on you as a as a recruiter so at what stage you're at in the process so if you have got vacancies there already right you know that this week i've got i've been given these vacancies yeah, you know, you come to your desk on one day and you're going to look right. OK, I'm going to work on this vacancy. Yep. And I need to look for candidates for that. You know, And all you're doing on LinkedIn is you're looking for that candidate. 
you know, sending messages out to um, get those candidates in, try and speak to them, try and get their CVs in. You then want to then um, later on in the day, you, you know, once you've got those kind of messages, speak to them, obviously set time for that. And then also you do want to do a bit more business development because just having those vacancies, it, it, you know, it's a very small pot. You know, so you want to then contact uh, firms to say, have you got any other vacancies or approach newer firms, you know, further out your uh, boundaries, you know, of areas. You're still working for this firm. So when did you first bill working as a recruitment consultant in Man- Was it in Manchester you were working? Yes, I was it? working in Manchester and it was really, really good. My first fee, I'll never forget, uh, you know, my first placement, should I say. Um, and we were on, I was working with this really great candidate you know um obviously i can't mention their name uh, for obvious reasons but a really really good candidate and um a really really good law firm as well and the match was there and the interview had been done the interviews had been done and then we were going on our christmas do to dublin okay so our Christmas party uh, and and the firm was very good. They were taking us to Dublin, you know, for a for a for a day and night stay, and then they come back the next day. And uh, it was on that trip that the firm called me to make the offer. Oh, where? Right, to make the offer, or uh, uh, you know, to say we'd like to make you the offer um, for this candidate. <clears throat> Uh, we think she's really good and um, they made you know they, they offered the sum then I spoke to the candidate and the candidate wanted slightly more um, and then I then went back to the firm this was all whilst I was in Dublin so you're negotiating back and forth negotiating back and forth and my heart was thumping out of my chest you know, because I just thought, because there's so many variables in recruitment, you know, they can yeah. make the offer, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the candidate will accept the offer. Went back to the law firm and I said, can there be a little bit more uh, negotiation? They said, they explained why, why not? And uh, I said, okay, that's a fair enough explanation. And then I went back to the candidate and I said, this is the reason why they can't up your salary uh, any more than they have. <clears throat> And she was fine. She was fine with that, and she understood that, and accepted the offer. Okay. And um, that off uh, that that fee paid for the whole trip <laughs> oh, <laughs> for the right. Dublin trip. Uh, you know, I think there was uh, about twenty of us who had gone, you yeah. know, including the directors. So, what kind of so, fee was that? Like, uh, uh, it was over ten k fee. Over ten k for your first fee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. And what terms was that agreed up? It was uh, 20%. 20%. 20%. So just for the listeners, when a recruiter says terms agreed at 20%, what does that mean? So basically, so let's say your salary is, let's say, uh, 50,000 a year, and you have a, a percentage agreed, so let's say 20%. So that's the fee will be 20% of that candidate's annual salary. Okay, so fifty per uh, if it's fifty thousand pounds, you know twenty percent. That's a ten thousand pound fee that you would get. That's one of the ways that that's one of the questions I get asked a lot is how do recruitment consultants actually make the money, and uh, that is one of the ways where you sign terms of business, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail. Uh, you sign your terms with the client, uh, whatever it may be, 20%, like you said, as an example, and then uh, the client will pay 20% of the candidate's first year agreed salary yeah. as a one-off fee. And That's then it, yeah. there's uh, rebate periods if the per- candidate leaves, which we can go into in a little bit more details. Or the other option is then where we sometimes agree flat fees of £5,000 or £3,000 plus VAT. Regardless of the salary. Yeah. Regardless of the salary. So those are the two main ways that we get paid in recruitment. That's really interesting. So you make your first fee, 10,000 plus fee. How does that feel? I was over the moon. And so were the, uh, so were my colleagues, my directors, because they knew I worked so hard um, for that 
feet you know I really put my effort in because I had quite a few you know before then uh, quite a few interviews that had gone through that fallen through you know and it was frustrating and it was you know I'd not done recruitment before this is a big thing for me <clears throat> it's a big thing for me and for it to happen in Dublin everyone was jolly everyone was you know merry and stuff and they were really really pleased they they all cheered you know and and they were really happy for me it's a really nice feeling your first fee this is a uh, you never forget your first fee I think. never forget i think i made six thousand six hundred pound in liverpool it was uh, a candidate working for a financial advisor and uh, that w- that candidate tested me as well he was I, I was over the moon when I got the offer from the client. Mm. They were like, yeah, we'll offer the candidate. It was a flat fee of £6,600 plus VAT. And I think the candidate was on £45,000. So if it was the other way around, it would have been a lot higher. Mm. But it was a £6,600 flat fee. And the uh, client called me and said, yeah, we'd like to offer this candidate £45,000. I was over the moon thinking, I was already thinking I'm going to spend the commission. You know, <laughs> when you're like, <laughs> counting yeah. your chickens before they've hatched. Yeah. Uh, call the candidate. And I'm like, oh, they've uh, they've accepted and uh, I was expecting him to be over the moon mm-hmm. because it was my first uh, yeah. fee. I didn't really expect this side of things. And then the candidate was just like, hmm, I'll, uh, I'll have to think about it over the weekend. It was yeah. a Friday. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, just accept it. You've just been offered a job, £40,000, yeah. everything you wanted. Yeah. But he didn't accept uh, he didn't accept it until I think Tuesday I got the call. So I'm mm. sweating all weekend. This is on my mind. Why would you, your, your mind's playing games yeah. with you. Like, why would he not want to accept is he slow ball? Is he like holding on for another opportunity? All these thoughts are going through your mind. Anyway, on Tuesday, he calls me and he says, uh, this was my second choice. I had another choice and I didn't get that job. And I was waiting for their feedback on Monday. Oh my God. So he only accepted the job because, because he didn't get he got declined job. by the other one. Mm. We just goes to show in recruitment that anything can happen anything can happen the look can either be in your favor or not in your favor yeah so that was my first six thousand six hundred pound uh which was a really really nice feeling and just seeing it go from getting the candidate cv going through the whole process process, and there's one thing learning about recruitment but once everything falls into place and you get that final fee and you're like damn this is how it works it is so uh exhilarating you know when you make the fee um, you feel top of the world. Yeah. You know, you, you feel over the moon, you know, the feeling is just, you know, it's like taking a drug basically, you know, um, you know, and you're just buzzing. Um, the, however, there's also a downside, as you know, when you don't make that fee and, uh, you know, you've worked hard. I mean, I had um, a candidate <clears throat> who was a partner. So you're talking high level, high level, you know, salary over a hundred grand, you know, terms agreed at like 20%, you know, also the potential of that person then building a team and me recruiting for that team. So the numbers were huge. (coughs) And um, I put the candidate forward, you know, just the CV in. Yep, happy days met that can you know the the firm met that candidate uh you know and over three months five interviews fifth interview was the last one this is over three months yeah and it's so much negotiate you know toing and froing about you know um can you meet this person at this time can you do that you know they're, they're all busy people anyway fifth interview was a board uh, the board uh, of directors was interviewing this this candidate. Everything done. Then I get the email saying perform really well, but the board have decided that this person's not for us. And my heart sank, and it just ruined my day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another you know, feeling. It just ruined my day. I can still like just like you know how I can vividly remember my first fee and all the details about that and everything. And that particular um, downfall, you know, I can still remember every little detail of disappointment because it was a big deal. And um, yeah, it just ruined my day, ruined a few days, actually, because you've got to try and pick yourself up. Because what happens as a recruitment consultant and you, you said it yourself, you know, you start counting your 
chickens before they've hatched and you see um you know oh yeah if i get this fee in i'm going to earn this much so then you start planning things you know and some of these fees can change your life you know when they come in they can change because they they're in bulk you know obviously i was working for a firm there so i wasn't going to get that full fee i was just going to get a percentage commission of that but still you know even the commission can be quite good so it was very disappointing but that's something that you have to bring yourself out of some can do it some can't and that's what differentiates you between being able to work in recruitment and not what kind of advice would you give to people that have gone into recruitment maybe not meeting their KPIs and targets and they're getting rejection after rejection how do you deal with that rejection and how do you stay motivated and positive so um i would say you have to kind of accept it for what it is embrace it embrace the disappointment you're not going to you're not going to place every person you put in for interview yeah you're not going to get an interview for every cv that you put forward right so just accept that that is part of the job yeah just like doctors and nurses they know they can't save everyone but if they really got affected every every time a person had died they won't be able to do the job and just like that in recruitment you know disappointment is part and parcel of the job and therefore you just have to take it on the chin and move on if you're getting knockbacks all the time there is an element of luck in this as well with every job yeah yeah um however then you need to kind of be a little bit more wiser or you know change the way you're doing things look at different people that you know to approach look at different firms to approach change the way you're doing things maybe to see if there's an improvement there that's really good advice so you've made a few fees i just want to touch upon what made you leave working as a recruitment consultant to start up your own recruitment uh, agency like what was the <coughs> change so um i was working in manchester living in bradford um you know and the travelling from bradford to manchester every day on the train you know i was taking the half six train you know i was getting there for you know uh, just before eight you know through winter through summer whatever the weather you know it was horrible uh the travelling was horrible you know whether i if whether i go by car or by train there was no difference the only kind of consolation by going by train was you can have a little bit of a nap or just not not having to concentrate on driving you know when you're going on the train and again coming back you know um you know you leave just after 5 or whatever and there's delays or whatever and i was getting home about you know 7 half 7 and 5 days a week and it drains you and um i thought to myself that i'm at a stage in life where i don't have too many responsibilities i don't have dependents such you know um therefore i can take a risk you know i'm living at home with parents you know and i can take the risk of if it doesn't work out for me for a certain amount of time um you know i've got the support of parents you know i've got a roof over my head um and i can afford to take that risk right now once things change in my life you know i've got more responsibilities i've got partner kids etc then you're more worried the risk is higher um so i thought okay there's nothing to lose so i thought okay i will you know come out of uh the agency that i'm working for and set up on my own and um you know i think for me personally it's the best thing that i've done absolutely you know i wouldn't change my decision um unfortunately uh when i came out of it and then i started setting up a few months later we went into covid <laughs> yeah, covid lockdown so yeah. that that time i remember quite clearly so it wasn't the best time to be launching your own business no and no one knew it was happening so if you were launching your business when covid had happened yeah. i would say that was not wise it's not wise right We didn't expect it um but if you launched your business just before covid 
um, and then COVID kicked in. That's just luck. No one knew. No one knew that. You know, and someone, some people have made an absolute killing out of COVID yeah. and their business, and some people have lost, lost a lot of money. Lost a lot of money. Yeah, I think the recruitment industry wasn't ideal in COVID because no. companies were not actively recruiting well in our industries. I'm in financial services and uh, healthcare, and you're in uh, the legal, legal industry. Yeah. So those kind of industries were on their ass, weren't they? Well, I had uh, three people in four interview, um, and they'd interviewed, and everything was on, waiting for offers. COVID kicked in, and they said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to hold. Just going to have to hold. Yeah. Um, call us in, you know, six weeks' time. Because we didn't know what was happening in COVID. Okay, six weeks' time, nothing's changed. Do you know what call is in six months' time? We've put a hold on all our recruitment, internal and external. So there was basically, just for that period, there was nothing. There was nothing going. And it was tough. Tough times. I think I remember starting up my soup brand around the time we were going into a lockdown yeah signing yeah, yeah, in the yeah. signing leases and buildings yeah. and all that stuff is spending thousands and thousands of pounds and uh and yeah going into lockdown and losing an absolute fortune i think you had to be really creative in covid um you know as to how to survive it was a survival game basically oh. I still had outgoings. I had no incomings because before, when I was working for the uh, recruitment consultancy, I still had a wage Basically. every month, whether I made a, a a fee or not. You know, I still had a wage, and in this situation, I had no um, I had no no income coming in whatsoever, yeah. and to survive in COVID, um, it was very difficult. Yeah, I had to be very inventive. So, you know, just as a pastime, um, I was looking on YouTube. And I, I, as you know, I say, if I like cooking, yeah. outdoor cooking, you know, and um, I always wanted my own tandoor. Yeah. You know, and um, I looked online as to how people were making it. And um, I looked at a few videos and I liked, you know, how this guy was making his, how this person was making his. So I amalgamated a few ideas. I made my own. And I, um, you know, made my own and I thought, yeah, works brilliantly, everything cooking in it. And I said to my dad, I said, you know, if any of your mates or, you know, uh, people that you know want one, let them know. And I sold a few. I made a sold a few. And that's how I survived in COVID. It shows you were creative. You you didn't sit on your ass and make up excuses. No. You went out, did something, covered the bills, made that's a little it. bit of money and uh and then you were then able to ride the wave so to speak yeah. which was an interesting time for a lot of people because people either sat on their ass and just got the grants and didn't do anything or <laughs> or they went out and they were creative yeah. like the farmhouse podcast that we just did their drive through that they were saying yeah, that they yeah. did a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners just adapted their businesses where they could this is it you had to you had to and it and showed it, that hustling side of a lot of people a lot of hustles came out of yeah. covid a lot of hustles i mean we saw you know teenagers you know making mocktails at home and selling them kid, yeah, you know mocktail. um sweet boxes you know and selling them from home you know for date nights and stuff like that yeah dessert boxes you know seafood boxes you know I with the those, lobster and all I, that i love those creative businesses uh, and and they made a killing yeah they made a killing. If I was a creative guy, I would love to, like, uh, you know, we, we were always thinking business <laughs> yeah, ideas yeah, yeah. and starting up different ventures and going to different industries. I would love to start up a few businesses in those this ventures. So yeah. if there's any t anyone creative that wants investment, <laughs> contact us. Because <laughs> we just, yeah. they're so beautiful and how they do all these boxes. And it. I think this even somebody it. I've just seen on their snap, they're selling snack boxes in Ramadan, you know, like with yeah, the yeah. honey and uh, loads of different biscuits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it just looks so nice and cute. Um, so we'll probably be ordering a few of them. So you've started up your own recruitment yeah. agency now. Let's just dive into that a little bit more. For somebody that wants to start up the recruitment agency, what are the steps to go about that? Uh, first of all, I think you need to get yourself on LinkedIn. Yep, set up your profile. Make sure your LinkedIn page um, for yourself, for your own profile. 
uh, is good. Um, secondly, the industry that you want to recruit for, you need to know a bit about that. Yeah, you need to know about that topic. Um, you know, um, so for example, I knew the legal industry. Um, I knew about the legal industry, therefore it wasn't an issue for me. Um, once you've done that, <clears throat> you then need to um, contact clients, see if they will give you uh, some roles, you know. At the same time, start building up your network. So just connect with, you know, people in that industry. So, for example, uh, I'm in the legal industry, so lawyers, paralegals, legal assistants, you know, cost lawyers, etc. from different, different areas of the country. Just connect with as many people as you can. Were you, just to <coughs> touch upon this subject, were you given a restricted covenant from your old firm that you're not allowed to contact any clients or candidates or work in the industry? Um, my firm uh, were quite good. Um, they, you know, my, my desk was a cold desk, so they knew that I'd built up, you know, and, um, and therefore they were quite fine with it. They were quite fine. I did say to them that I wanted to start my own business, you know, my own recruitment business, and they were happy. They didn't see me as a threat. No way. That's interesting. Yeah. And the thing is, you've got to think about that. They've got so many recruiters, right? And they're billing so much. I am not a threat because, um, you know, I I, I not stole any data, not taken anything from them. I had my own LinkedIn. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I was then setting up on my own. So it's going to take me longer time a lot longer time to get to where they are which i didn't have i was building up everything for myself and re remember when i was working for them you know i had admin assistants who would format the cvs for me you know sort other bits and bobs out whereas everything that i was doing for my own firm my recruitment pal i had to do myself that's being the admin assistant that's being the you know um, a person who makes the calls, you know, everything, director, doing the bills, everything, sorting out the invoices, everything. So would you recommend people start up their own business or from your own personal experience? I think if you've got the patience, you've got the determination and you are not afraid of uh, disappointment, mm -hmm. disappointment and being disheartened by not making fees then yes if you're a person who wants to go into business and see quick quick results like when you're selling shoes or you're selling a product and you're getting in the money straight away then no because you're not going to get the money in straight away you have to wait for the money to come in there'll be notice periods start dates you know all that kind of a thing and then retention periods there's a lot more to consider it's different, isn't it? Because we, I've got different businesses where, I, for example, the bespoke suit business mm. where I can mm. sell a suit. If you want to buy a suit, you can buy a suit instantly. Boom, done, dusted, eight, nine hundred pound, five hundred pound, whatever. We can close a deal. Money can get transferred the same day. It's an instant sale. Mm. With being in recruitment, you're having to wait, like you said, months and months and months. And it could fall through at the end of all that hard work, which is something that is hard to get your head around even for somebody mm. who's been in it for the best part of eight years it's hard to get your mind around the fact that you can put so much work into something in a big deal and it could just fall through and you're not going to get yeah, paid a course. penny for it you would probably make more money in some cases going out and begging for two three <laughs> yeah. pounds so if a if a homeless person for example yeah. this is how i used to think about it if a homeless person is on the road on lee's road for example and he's asking for money i can remember driving past one day and you know, would give him a fiver or, you know, he'd, he'd have like maybe 10, 15, 20 pound in his uh, his little bucket for the day. He's making more money doing that then than we you are, are yeah. in recruitment, if that makes it sense in some cases, yeah. which is hard for your mind to accept. You see, the cash flow is not there. So you could have, like, for example, I made uh, three fees, four fees, about three fees um, in the space of six weeks. And you made them all together, didn't you? All together. And um, that was a yearly wage, right? Then you might not make much for the next few months. So it kind of balances and covers so it. So it kind of ba balances, but you could be waiting for months first, 
you know it could be the other way around that you don't make anything for so long then you make it all but what do you do in that time so yeah. you have to have some kind of savings or i would say some kind of security where your overheads are minimal basically you don't need much to start up your recruitment agency you just need a space to work and a laptop that's it that's all you need and a mobile phone yeah, you can't yeah. start a recruitment agency with those stores if you've got the gift of the gab and you if know you've got what you're the gift of the gab that's all you need you know um it's then i can you survive with no wage for five months six months most people can't especially if you have kids or family and a wife and this you need to pay bills and all the rest of it but i think in the early days when you're living at home with your family you don't have those responsibilities like you said you can then take those risks and if mm-hmm. you don't earn anything for six months it's absolutely fine because in six seven months like you said which we're going to go into in a little bit more detail when those three fees come in you're like wow that's a this yearly salary so that's something that people listeners that want to start a recruitment agency need to understand and in some cases have a side hustle uh, yeah. have a part-time job even like for me was i working i think i was working in marks and spencers on the weekend yeah, 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 yeah. so on saturday sunday i would go stack shelves all day and at the end of the month i'd come out with five five hundred six hundred pound which is a decent amount mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. for the weekend but they'd be long hours on the weekend mm-hmm. And then Monday to Friday, I'd be trying to build up my business. And then I would survive on that five, six hundred pound because maybe those days, Mm. I feel like I'm talking like a granddad those days. (laughs) But you could survive on five, six hundred pound. You'd be like a 50 pound here, 50 pound there. Nowadays, it's a cost of living crisis. It's completely different. But back then, 500 pound, you could survive on for a full month. And we weren't going out to Shisha or restaurants and all the rest of it. It was uh, just simple living. Simple living. living. But that 500 quid was it was able to last for the full mm. month and it would cover i can remember i actually had a 200 pound allowance mm. for the bill bills for the business so mm. I, I had a phone bill and then i had a crm system mm. which we'll talk about and that 200 pound was for business and then still 300 pound i could survive on this for like a it. phone bill and the rest of the little bit so that's something that listeners need to be wary of now talking about the three fees so you've not billed for a while you're trying to put in the hard work for your business the first three fees that come in, they came come through at the same at the same time. I remember that quite vividly. So talk to me about those three fees. So there's a good aspect and a bad aspect for that. Basically, uh, the good aspect is you've made that money. Yeah, you know that you've got the security uh, for the year as yeah. a wage. You know, uh, you can pay yourself a wage for the year, and you know that's fine. The bad aspect of that is you get too comfortable. Yeah, you know that money's there, and it kind of for some people it will motivate them no end to make more because they find that's not enough. Yeah, and for some people, oh, that's a comfort. Oh, do you know what? I can't be asked today. <laughs> I've got the money. Is I can't be He's asked today, and that can happen. Yeah, to a certain extent, uh, at times that happened to me, where um, not directly, but where I would get involved in other things right um and my business would not be a priority uh, at that time you know sometimes you'd be like oh, okay yeah i've got this to do you know i'll do that because I, in the back of my mind i know that i've got that security yeah that i've made that money so if i didn't sit at my desk i'm not panicking your bills are paid for the next two three years it's fine <clears throat> however money doesn't last you know, money does go, and when you are out of it, it's it's just like starting all over again, and you don't want to do that. So my advice to all the uh, listeners out there is, don't get complacent. You know, if you've made the fees, fine, you've made the fees, but carry on making those fees. Like That's it. what differentiates you from being a very average recruiter to a very successful recruiter and business person. Yeah, that is good advice. And I think what you're referring to there is pipeline management and being able to build that pipeline and uh, not just short term, one or two months, but build a pipeline for a year. So for me, if a candidate says I'll be looking next year, I will put a note in that diary to call that person next year. Same goes for a client. We might have some vacancies in September. 
I might be looking at it now and when we're recording this it's March yeah. a lot of people are like ah oh, forget it you know what leave it I will put that note in my diary in September and then you've got something to have a conversation with that client mm. about when you call them in September it might sound like a long time but September comes around soon enough and then you speak to them and you're like oh we had a chat in March do you remember you said you might be recruiting in September now you've got rapport with that customer yes. they feel like they know you and you know them and you've got some sort of reputation because of you're course. talking like that of course but it's only because you noted that down in your diary yeah they might even not even be recruiting at that time but that's how I've had a lot of success so and, and the thing is remember you're recruiting for the future so unless someone is available here and now you know and they don't have any notice period you know the average candidate has a, a notice period a notice period of three months so even if you place them today you're not going to get any money coming through until three months and then you've got a period where if they don't pass their probation uh, uh, probation you might have to give some kind of refund so yeah. it's a long process so the work you do now pays off for the months ahead yeah so you've got a like you say a pipeline management brilliant so first three fees let's talk i'm sure the listeners want to know numbers they want to know what are the figures so first three fees running your own recruitment agency business let's talk about the three fees what kind of numbers are we talking so if my memory serves right i think the first two fees uh were uh, about f- three three thousand pounds each okay so three or three or four thousand pounds each I can't, I can't remember exactly and they were just fixed fees yeah so it didn't matter what the wage was for that candidate they were just fixed fees the other um the other fee uh the big fee was i think about Twelve thousand. Yeah, 12, or slightly pounds. over twelve thousand. I can't remember exactly. That's a nice fee. Um, so can you see straight away? You've got a good amount of money there. Was that a salary based fee? Salary based fee. So that was just a percentage. And for listeners that might be asking, why some people choose the salary and some people choose the base fixed fee rate. It's just because some clients don't want to pay their percentage. Do yeah, they? so some. I mean, I was in a position. Now you see that firm that I had uh, the fixed fee uh, terms agreed. That was at that time. Now I've got a percentage fee. So you terms changed agreed. over. Yeah, from... we've changed over. But that's because I've had successful recruitment with them. You know, I've sent them good uh, candidates, and then I've said to them, I've been in a position to say, look, negotiate and say, look, I'm sending you good candidates. If you want more you know i need to up the terms on this and this is you know let's come to some kind of negotiation and the way i played it was i know you're not going to agree at 20 percent. yeah let's meet in the middle and go for 15 and it was agreed agreed at 15 percent. Now that's really good advice for the listeners and people that wanted to start their own agency is is better to agree that fixed flat fee get your foot in the door build a relationship make it. a placement and then there's always room for negotiation later on down the line. And, and I mean, you know, I had, I wasn't in a position, you know, three grand, three, four grand was better than zero. Yeah. Yeah. If I didn't agree that they would have said no. <coughs> right. And what what's, what's worse? And I think because you're running your own recruitment agency, you're keeping the full three, four grand. So it means a lot more than That's working it. for a firm, getting the three grand and getting like a, five percent commission and which is peanuts yeah so in that sense it works for you so you've got a three grand fee a three grand fee and a 12 grand fee so do you say you've got nearly twenty thousand pound coming all at once how is that like what kind of uh what kind of work have you had to do to get that so basically you know i had to really really send so many messages out you know um to get the cvs in and it's a bit of a numbers game. The more you do, the more you get out. You know, the, the the more messages you will send, the more replies you will get. You've got to make the calls. You've got to speak to them, get the CVs and send those CVs to the clients, ho- hoping that, you know, they're good quality and, you know, they're uh, to what the client wants. And if they are, they'll, you know, interview them. And then you're hoping that the candidates performed well as well because it's not just about the cv 
you know it's about the candidate as well and uh, sometimes they look good on paper but they don't come uh, come very good they don't come across well in in person yeah it's a double sale isn't it you're trying to sell to the candidate and sell to the client yeah so let's just do a quick two minute study of the 12 grand fee i just want to dissect a few Mm. things so how did you get the client so i uh, on linkedin it was the head of department for that department it was cost department and um they were uh, uh, they were head of department for Dublin and they were head of De- uh, sorry for Ireland and uh, the UK. So I just sent a LinkedIn message saying hi so and so you know um, um, I'm from recruitment pal you know my recruitment pal and uh, I specialize in uh, this area of legal recruitment you know um, if you need do you have any requirement for candidates you know both in england and uh, and ireland and she messaged me back saying yes you know please email me some cvs and there you go simple as that it sounds very simple but that there was an element of luck there because you could message people and they don't reply you so, get that all the time and you get that all the time and that's the disheartening bit and that's something that you've got to deal with that not everyone will reply to every single message that you send out and um you know um i sent across the cvs didn't hear didn't hear so then i rang and they said you know look sorry being busy we've got a hr person who's going to be working with me so they will be in touch with you and then they got in touch you know we agreed terms got these p- uh, candidates in for interview and there we go it's a good one so those candidates so the client signs the terms of business sends that back to you signed. well uh, i sent my terms of business but they said we'd i'd have to agree to theirs and that's you do get a lot of that okay. you're not always going to get terms uh that they will agree to your terms however in one sense their terms were slightly better so just for the listeners the terms of business is a legal document uh, is a contract basically a contract, yeah. between you and the client and it outlines all the clauses so rebate periods the fee that they're going to pay and it's just a legal document that you need to protect yourself uh, so you make sure that they sign that document before you send over any candidates and if you yeah. don't then obviously you're going to lose out and uh, what was that was it yeah, you that was, was talking to yeah, about yeah there was a friend of mine who who's also in recruitment and uh, he'd call me for some advice saying you know terms weren't signed you know but um, one of the HR people said yeah send us across the CVs you know we'll have a look and etc he sent and they said we they weren't interested in that candidate okay at the time so that's it he didn't think anything of it then I think six weeks later, he looks at that candidate's LinkedIn and sees that they're employed by them. So something had gone wrong, he'd got in touch and th- because there was no contract signed, there's no legal there's no legal stance that you can take to say, okay, you know, we agreed any 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 kind of commitment. So he's lost know, that payment. They lost that lost that lost that pay packet there. And it happens all the time. And with myself, I've experienced it as well. Something very similar where I sent a candidate to an interview uh, for a well-known bank in Nottingham, I think it was. Client came back and said, no, he's not suitable for us. Spoke to the candidate, that's fine, all well and good. Two months later, I see that candidate has changed his LinkedIn details as now working for that client. So I was thinking that's a little bit iffy and uh, just for the listeners one thing that we put in our contracts is a 12 month introduction clause yeah which basically means if i send a client uh, a candidate for an interview and they reject that candidate they cannot employ that candidate for another 12 months Hmm. so they can't just reject that person and then two months later oh we'll hire that person now i am still eligible for that fee so i emailed the hr contact and they're like oh yeah we were just about to call you we were going to let you know that we've uh, hired this person uh, we took that person's number during interview stage which is something else to watch out for they will exchange contacts it happens all the time and they hired that person so back and forth they wanted to pay 
the agreed amount i think they wanted to pay a smaller amount than what was actually agreed i think that was a eight thousand pound fee but they wanted to pay four thousand pound because they said they'd done all the work themselves <laughs> you know uh but they paid it all out some email well, you exchange. were very lucky you're very yeah. lucky in that and because place. it was a bank and because yeah you can threaten legal action and they've signed the contracts and we have the terms of business mm -hmm. soon as he sent that to them and if you word the email correctly boom payments in your bank account and yeah. uh and if they don't pay you can charge interest so that yeah. was one case so just for listeners these little things if you start up a recruitment agency without working for a firm you won't know these little things yeah. these yeah. are little things that you learn as you experience in the in, uh, as you have experience within the industry and you don't want to learn these things from experience you want to be able to be taught these things otherwise you're working for free because you will be sending series left right and center uh because you've got no terms you've got nothing agreed they can actually use those series and contact the candidates directly themselves and approach them some firms have it in their careers page for recruitment agencies yeah that if we do not have signed agreed terms with you we have no obligation towards any cvs that you sent and any cvs that you send to us without any agreement will be deemed our property they put that as a clause on their website and though. they put that as a clause on their website and therefore if you don't know about that and you're just doing in good faith thinking oh yeah i'll just send them 15 cvs they're all good candidates they they can employ all 15 and you won't make a penny you lose out on that yeah so twelve thousand pound fee we've now got the terms of business signed it wasn't your terms of business it's their terms of business let's go on to candidates so you've done the business development side candidate side so you're running your own business you're building it up how do you then get the candidates so i get my candidates through linkedin mainly i mean there are other um sort of in the legal industry you've got you know um other legal um cv databases you know um that you can kind of um subscribe to so all the cvs are there you know, uh, so you you know things like cv library a monster and there's all kind of um indeed and stuff those are um databases that uh, recruiters can get a subscription for so they can get the cvs off those databases so that's another way you can do the other way you can do is um go on to uh the company's website you know the the the, the, the companies that you're looking for where the candidates work and kind of ring them that can go in a couple of ways <laughs> you know candidates don't always like being called at work at their desk yeah um, so that's headhunting that's headhunting um but mainly through linkedin okay so linkedin is is useful headhunting is really interesting have you had much experience with headhunting or yes i have i mean um i do headhunt and i've called candidates at their desk some have just said very quietly yep can you call me at another time here's my mobile done and uh, uh some other people have complained and i'll be honest with you this is for the viewers uh you know listeners out there and, and yeah. you'll laugh at this i had a, a um a, a candidate that i'd headhunted um called at the desk and she took all my details i innocently gave my details you know my recruitment pal etc and then uh, i told her the firm that i was recruiting for and then what she does is she calls that firm complaining about me right she didn't use my name she just complained that someone from my recruitment pal had called uh, you know and doing this and it's not acceptable so that my the firm the client that i'm working with looks bad yeah they then emailed me saying you know we've had this complaint you know and i said yeah it's a staff member <laughs> that's how i got around it it's a staff member who's new you know it won't happen again you know i appreciate they didn't realize etc and that's how i covered it off so that's a, that's a good save <laughs> it's a Blame good save staff you've got a you've got a staff member that doesn't exist <laughs> yeah. but you know um i think that that lady you know again like i said you, you 
you never not know what everyone you're gonna, you never know yeah, what you're gonna get you, never you know could open a can expect. of worms or a, 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 or, a, a or a treasure yeah. chest yeah yeah I've, I've placed candidates that i've headhunted and uh for the listeners the benefits are you're actively reaching people that have not been bombarded on every cv library and, yeah. and, and online job platform they're not on linkedin so they're not being approached by loads of recruiters so that's sometimes where you find the hidden gems yeah uh, when I first started in recruitment and I was working for a firm, my boss was big on headhunting. But he had the worst strategy. So I was new. Think about this. I was new to recruitment. He sat next to me. He's, he's a really uh, bossy, abrupt kind of individual. Snaps if you say the wrong thing, that kind of individual. And uh, he goes to me, we're going to do headhunting today, one-on-one headhunting. And he goes, I want you to call the firm and I want you to find this person, Derek, so call H, uh, call the receptionist and say to the receptionist that it's a family emergency and wow. it's a family emergency for Derek. And I was like, that sounds a bit ro- much, th- yeah. a bit too much. Yeah, because the guy's going to be worried, you yeah. know, family emergency. That's not starting off on the right foot. Hmm. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, it's worked for me a million times. This guy, ne- he was just one of those. I was wow. all talk, make you do all the work hmm. and sit back and, and, and relax himself. So I called this firm and I've been like, family emergency for Derek as an example and uh, she's like okay that's fine um, who are you I was like I'm, I'm just a friend okay transfers to Derek he's got on the phone he's like hello hello is, every, is everything okay I was like hi hi I'm a recruitment consultant he goes oh fuck off <laughs> 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 he just yeah, flipped yeah. and he just he was so pissed off yeah and he just goes oh fuck like you know like when yeah, you yeah. when you get those ppi yeah, calls yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. you get those uh call center type calls he was fuming so and that really affected my confidence i didn't do headhunting for a while after that you see the thing is you, you, for some people for a very uh seasoned recruiters that that doesn't put them off yeah also it depends on how you are as a person as well whether you can take it on the chin or not yeah it's um, not easy and it's not easy and i think maybe that that kind of i mean it's worked for for him and he's he's been very successful as you know um but it doesn't work for everyone someone uh, you know what you call there is um the the people at reception are the gatekeepers yeah. what we call in recruitment and they don't always allow the call through or yeah. they'll say they're busy or it's not going through or whatever uh, but you just have to kind of be persistent you know and if it does get to their direct dial number you do have got it then you know speak to them but you've got to have the balls to do it yeah it's a very daunting task so I just want to touch upon the candidates then. How did you get the candidate for the £12,000 role? I messaged on LinkedIn. Yep. Um, so that they're right for the role that you know I was looking for. Uh, messaged them. And this candidate had been with her firm for many years. So it was a tough one. She had a lot of questions when I spoke to her. I had to be honest with her, build her uh, confidence. Build, you know, And at the same time, Honesty pays a big policy. If you do not know the answer to a question that a candidate has, instead of blagging it, just say, I don't know, but I'll find out. And then go and find out and come back to come back to them. That will show that you're quite honest rather and, and you know, people can see through you sometimes. So, you know, if if you're talking a lot of shit you know, they'll, they'll see that. Yeah, I think that's a, a something that honesty is the best way forward. And also, whilst we're on candidates, candidate management is quite big and managing their expectations and understanding that people you've got lie. You've someone on 20,000 wanting 40,000. Yeah. You know, you've got that, you know, salary expectations are very high because they think they're it. You know, they think they're God's given gift. You know, you'll get candidates like that. And the market doesn't justify that. And the market do- doesn't justify that. And you got some candidates who underestimate themselves, you know, that you've got candidates who are on a lower salary, you know, who do deserve a higher salary. And you can see that and you can build their confidence to say, look, we can get you a higher salary because you've got this level of experience. I've seen other candidates with that level of, uh, that level of experience and responsibilities and they're on this salary you know so it can work that way um and every candidate has a different reason for wanting a new job yeah you know 
either the one that they're working at is too far from their home so the commute's horrible they're willing to take a pay cut someone just more money full stop they're not bothered about anything else some don't like the culture of the place that they're working at you know so they want somewhere smaller or somewhere bigger you know or they don't get along with one of the people that they're working with and they want something different you have know. you had any crazy crazy stories or yeah I, I spoke to a candidate only a couple of days ago and you know that candidate had worked at various firms and told me each story about each firm that they'd worked and why they wouldn't work there again so there was an issue everywhere he went and um for me that's a difficult one yeah that is a difficult one because then you it puts doubts into your mind that whether this candidate is a problem or whether the firms were a problem oh, have you had any crazy stories of uh, candidates and the reasons for leaving you know candidates not wanting to work with their manager that's there so you know they've had bad experience with that person and sometimes um it could be that they've worked at this firm with them had a horrible time but then that person is now working at the firm that you're proposing to them as an option and as soon as they hear that they'll say no so there's so many different reasons you know some people you know have crazy crazy um kind of uh, reasons as to why they're not you know why they're not I've about some wild stories i think i had one candidate at a place this was the perfect candidate they never really moved i think they had about 10 years experience 10 15 years experience working for the same firm growing in that firm as well and uh, i asked him why he's leaving and uh, he said he had an affair with uh, wow. somebody at work and his wife had found out and she either said our marriage or your career and where you work and this guy was on some serious money i think he was probably a partner earning decent money so it was a huge thing mm. for him to step down and leave and he wasn't going to get anything like that no because you have to build and work your way up mm. on a company uh but he chose his marriage which fair play to him even though he had an affair so i can't really say fair <laughs> play to him but uh, he chose his marriage and uh and left that firm so for me it was a golden ticket i got him a job straight away uh and he was a big big player i think the he was on a 100 plus salary so it was a decent fee but yeah it just goes to show you don't know what why people are re- leaving and mm. what the reason is so yeah managing a candidate's expectations and finding out the reason for the leave is very important especially for mm. uh, this is something i want to tell our listeners is because if it will help you when it comes to the offer stage because if somebody doesn't really have a valid reason for leaving and ah, i'm just seeing what i can get out there and maybe might want a few thousand pound extra increase in the salary then guess what once they get to the offer stage and they tell their boss that they're leaving all they're going to do is use your hard work and get an offer to then go to their boss and say look i've been offered 40,000 pound i'm on 35 counter offer me and i get this all the yeah. time so they'll use your offer and all your hard work to just, just to get, get a counter an offer and an increase in salary. in salary so that's something to be wary of and at the beginning if you know that's what they're trying to do save yourself the time and uh and also you want to look at how quickly they're moving firms they're jumping from one firm to another firm you know every so many months or every year or something there's something not right yeah you know and that's a little bit frowned upon you know that you because there's no commitment yeah any firm that wants to take a candidate on wants to look at you know why should i bring this candidate on board are they going to stay because they're paying an x amount in recruitment fees yeah so they are paying for the candidate and if they're going to stay six months to a year it's not worth it for them you know and um you want to kind of look at that that you don't want to be placing candidates who are jumping from one shop to another shop you know left right and center um so always find out why why your candidate is leaving yeah you know sometimes the fault is in the candidate not in the client that's very true so you get the candidate through the interview stages they do they accept the offer straight away or not necessarily like you said uh, earlier you know they'll take the weekend to think about it or they'll take a few days to think about it because they've either got either other offers on the table or other interviews that they still 
going on. Sometimes they'll accept straight away. They'll be delighted over the moon. So it just depends on wh- what things they've got going on. So for your £12,000 fee, was that an instant accept or was it a bit more of No, that was uh, thinking. Um, thought it over the weekend. Um, just because that candidate had been at her own firm for quite some years. So it was daunting for her to go into a new role, go into a new place of work, working for a new firm, you know, and she wanted to speak to her husband, her family, you know, just to see if it was the right decision that she was making. And that's what it was. So it wasn't any other offers or anything like that. It was just to make sure that she, in her own mind, was making the right decision for herself. So you get that as well. Okay. So what kind of advice would you give to somebody that is potentially wanting to get into recruitment, start up their own agency? You know, um, my advice is if you're wanting to get there out in recruitment, you've got to be very proactive. You've got to make sure that you put the time and effort in. You know, you're, if you want a nine to five job, this is not for you. Okay. Having your own business means you've got to work harder. You've got to work longer to make that effort. Once you've made it, you can then reduce your hours. That's fine. You can have other staff if you want, etc. You know, but on, up until then, remember, you've not only got the admin side of things to do, the background, you know, sorting out maybe your website if you want one, you know, doing all the business development, calling the candidates. And also sometimes, you know, candidates are at work. If they're all, if you're trying to employ someone who's already in a job, they're working, let's say typical hours nine to five, they might not be able to speak, you know, um, during working hours. You, you've got a window of either before they start work, which means eight o'clock, half eight, seven o'clock, whatever time if they agree to that. Then you've got a window of lunchtime hours. Yeah. And then you've got a window of after they finish work. That is out of the nine to five, except for the lunchtime. So you are working longer hours. It's not ideal for somebody who wants short hours. It, it, it does require a lot of hard work and effort and a hell of a lot of long hours, late nights. So if you have uh, a situation where you need to leave at five o'clock and it's just not going to work. It's just not going to Most of work. your success is going to happen before and after yeah. core office hours. So... Yeah, the guys that I've worked with that are the multi-million pound billers are the guys that are machines. The people that are machines that work day and night, they're put, willing to put in the hours, but it is one of the only industries that will reward you extremely lucratively for This is a hardware. reward to risk ratio um, is there, you know, but it's the, the reward to uh, work ethic ratio is there. The yeah. harder you work, the more you'll be rewarded. Okay. So what kind of personality do you think it takes to succeed in recruitment? If you are a quiet, shy person who finds it difficult to talk to strangers, this is not for you. If you are a person who you're confident, you can speak, you know, you can speak to someone who you don't know, you know, and you can build a rapport with them, this is for you. It's as simple as that. You can't be shy, you can't be, you know, fearful of talking to someone and it's all about sending them a message. Yes, the initial communication might be a message, might be an email, but then you've got to speak to them. And if you don't have that confidence in yourself uh, or you're very shy and you feel that you, it's not, it's not it's something that you can't do, then this is not for you. And that's very, very true. Um, okay, so... Somebody wants to start up a recruitment agency, whether CEO or club, people that are watching this are probably mm. going to want to start up their own recruitment agencies. What's the advice that you'd give? Like, how do they start? So what do they need? Did you say you can work from home? Laptop, phone? You need laptop. You need a phone. Yeah. You need internet. Okay. Okay. You need to set up a LinkedIn account. Free account you can do. Yeah, you can free account you can do. Um, and... I would strongly recommend if you've not done recruitment before to do a course uh, and to work for somewhere, work for a recruitment firm before you get into recruitment. You also need to know the industry that you're working in. You need to know about it. 
right? So for example, if you just said today, like uh, a lot of you viewers have seen me and, and I work in the legal industry and you think, okay, do you know what? I'll go in the legal industry. But you've had no runnings with the re legal industry. You've never worked for a law firm. You've never worked in legal recruitment. You don't know certain terms, terminology. You don't know what a paralegal does. You wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know what, you know, certain, what a commercial lawyer is, what a, you know, corporate lawyer is, what they do, you know, banking and finance lawyer, you know, there, there is, you know, um, um, financial real estate lawyer. There's all sorts of different types of categories. You wouldn't know any of that. You need to be able to consult in the industry. Because you need to in. come across confident. If the client f sh sees that you don't know what you're talking about, they're going to see you're wasting our time. Yeah, and they want to work with somebody that understands their industry. Because it's saturated. The market is saturated with so many recruiters out there. What makes you any different? And if you don't know the basics of yeah. your industry or the topic that you're going into, it's a fail straight away. Yeah, niche recruitment agencies in a specific niche sector. Yeah. Definitely the way forward, unless you're going down the route of a generic role, which is difficult, but it can be done. I know people that yeah, just recruit I mean, admin. Yeah, staff. so if you're recruiting an admin, it doesn't matter what sector yeah. they're for. An admin is an admin, and you're looking at their core skills of an admin role. As opposed okay? to the industry. But for example, I do legal recruitment, you do financial services. If I were to now transfer to financial services, it would be very difficult. I would need to learn from you the terminology and what an accountant does, you know, what another financial advisor does, what a para planner does. Hey, you hey, know. I'm impressed you know what a yeah. para planner is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I would need to know in a bit more detail what the different types of roles are, what the different types of work is. Um, Qualifications. Qualifications, what they need, etc., to do that job, then I can do it. Yeah. Then I can come across confident and say, okay, yes, I can recruit for that. You know? Yeah, that's true. And uh, so you've got that. Do you need a CRM system? Initially, no. Initially, uh, until you've made your first couple of fees and you've got the you've got the candidates there, you've got enough candidates there. Uh, and you've got enough clients there, you wouldn't need one. You can just use a spreadsheet, Excel, to do that. Once you build yourself up, you've got then you've got a number of candidates, you've got a number of clients, and you want to keep track because you're going, to, you're placing candidates, and then you know later on you you want to come back to them candidates, and you remember, you know, um, where you placed them and also candidates that you spoke to that let's say say to you in six months time call me you want to you want a crm system where you can go back and look for that kind of and look at what you spoke about to refresh your memory yeah yeah so crm system is important but it's not essential to get going because yeah. it is an expense try and keep your expenses as to a minimum minimal as possible i think when i first started up my own agency i used a a CRM system called Recruit So Simple mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's a really good system it was built by people that were recruitment consultants so they know what it needs and I'm sure I was only paying £50 a month which is very cheap for a CRM system yeah. uh, so that's one way of doing it once you've got the data the whole point of CRM system is the data is the data if you've got no data then start off on Excel start, start off on Excel build the if data if you've got the data there then it makes more sense because then, then you can start sense. working in cities and yeah. uh, so what a lot of recruitment agencies do is when they hire recruitment consultants they give them a geographical location so yes. they'll say do London and you're doing Liverpool and you're doing Manchester the northwest uh, uh, down south Yorkshire whatever it is so when you're running your own business you can do the whole country you can work yeah. wherever you want and pick the vacancies that you're working on so I would probably recommend yeah later on down the line invest in a CRM system build up your database for candidates and clients and put the notes and the CVs and that ultimately is what a recruitment agency is. That's it. It's what their CRM system is. It's, it's what data do they have, what candidates do they have, what clients do they have, what connections do they have and how do they get to their clients and the candidates before anyone else it's does. matchmaking. Matchmaking and you yeah. need that system in place. So this is just a, a sort of introduction podcast uh, because I'm in 
the recruitment industry with recruitment rooms at my own recruitment agencies you're in the recruitment industry with your agency it's uh, it's one of those where i wanted to get a few podcasts in i get asked questions all the time on the recruitment industry so it's nice to be able to have these kind mm. of conversations people that are wanting to start up their recruitment agencies can listen to us first watch this podcast they'll have lots of questions which they can email to us and then we can do a follow up podcast where we can answer all the answer questions all the they questions, have yeah of course uh, do a sort of uh, podcast and on their questions help people in any way we can either get into the recruitment industry whether that's working for somebody starting up their own recruitment agencies and then uh, we'll have one where we dive into a little bit more detail about our back story how we know each other the business ventures that we're in yeah. we're always working together looking for ideas businesses and uh, and other things so it'll be good to do a back story you know then cover just general topics yeah. uh, how does that sound Perfect yeah I look forward to episode 2 brilliant and uh, <laughs> thank you for coming on to the CEO club podcast thank you podcast. for having me uh, any final advice you would give to our viewers i think just be confident if you think it's the right time for you to start up your own business to ta- uh, start up your own recruitment agency you know think about it and if you truly feel that it is the right time and you are going to put 110% in then go for it don't look back if you feel that you are unsure or you're double minded or you don't have 110% to put into it then don't do it you know um go and do a 95 job or something else or go look at another business venture it's not you something know. you can do half you can't do half heartedly it's going to take all of you to do it you know and if you if you've got that effort and mindset go for it you know, and you'll smash it I'll pay off. No, thank you very much. I will see you on the next podcast. Thank you very much.